Vampires, undead beings that subsist by feeding on the life essence of the living. Our thirst for their myth is as persistent and insatiable as theirs is for blood. We see them in classic literature, movies, television, and more. But where did the legend come from? Vampire folklore can be traced back to as early as the 18th century. Today, many may think of them as fictitious, but this was not always the case. The Western world was first introduced to the vampire legend by Eastern Europeans. Widespread legends led to mass hysteria and in some cases resulted in the staking of corpses and the desecration of graves. Though the names of these creatures varied, like Striga in Albania, Rykolikos in Greece, and Strigoi in Romania, they were united by the power of their myth. The most famous vampire is, of course, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Stoker loosely based his most famous creation on a 15th century Romanian prince known for his reputation for extreme cruelty. Our modern take on vampires, perhaps most exemplified by Bela Lugosi's portrayal of Dracula, are revenants, human corpses that are said to return from the grave to harm the living. These vampires have Slavic origins, only a few hundred years old. But other, older versions of the vampire were not thought to be human at all, but instead supernatural, possibly demonic entities that did not take human form. But are the legends based in any kind of reality? There are a few truly vampiric animals, including leeches, lampreys, and vampire bats. But humans are far from immune to the sway of vampirism. Shrouded in the shadows, there exists a worldwide community of like-minded people who consider themselves real vampires. Though they may not be creatures of lore, these groups carry on an eerie and mysterious legacy into the modern age. And of all the creatures in the world, human is the most dangerous. Fortunately, a new species has risen to supplant them. I have seen this before. United by a single purpose. What the hell are they up to? They will be hunted down and destroyed. They're onto something new here, something big. When the time comes, we're gonna need people like you. The Strain. Premier Sunday, July 16th at 10 on FX. Our guest today is Father Sebastian. He is the international personality at the center of the world's vampire subculture. He is the founder and the empresario of the world famous Endless Night Vampire Ball, as well as a renowned fangsmith and author. Father Sebastian, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to meet you. Absolutely. I heard a lot about you. <laughs> is that so? Well, I've heard more about you, sir. Well, we can exchange some notes afterwards. <laughs> well, you really get around, like, as, as those notes said, you are really at the very dead epicenter of this vampire subculture, so there's no one better to talk to about sort of the history and the background of the vampire legend. And I'm wondering how exactly that whole thing came to be. Why, why is the vampire so present in our, in our uh, culture today? The reason why it's so present is because it has evolved over since it began. Uh, the vampire, like ghosts and changelings and fairies and gods and spirits, has been with us since the beginning of human culture. It's one of the oldest myths in human history. And what's even more interesting is, is every culture around the world, from Japan to China, like the China had the hopping vampire, and ancient Samaria had the Anunnaki. Um, there's, you know, every single culture in human history has had a vampire myth. And recently, um, is the blood drinking came into it. Mm. It's always been these energy beings, like the Incubi and Succubi of ancient Sumeria, um, or, you know, the Ka spirits of ancient Egypt, and Dracula and Elizabeth Bathory, more common living vampires, mm -hmm. or people that are associated with the vampire myth, are actually a recent addition to the 
lineage or the legacy of the vampire mythology. Interesting. How recent would you say? Uh, you know, 14th, 15th century. Okay, so on the on the grand time span, there it's pretty re fairly uh, towards our current day. After 12,000 to... years of mythology, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Because of course that's the first image that comes to mind sure. in the modern context. But I'm wondering, bringing us up to the present day, mm -hmm. um, about the modern vampire subculture, can you give us some idea on what it really means to be a part of that world? Well, the modern vampire subculture is a relatively new invention. It started in the 1990s, okay, as in an actual solidified culture. And it kind of was embryotic inside the vampire, the masquerade role-playing games. Uh, there was a vampire organization. Uh, the first vampire organization started in France. It was a Luciferian vampire cult uh, in Paris. In Paris, um, that was the first organization that I know of that was publicly identifying as a vampire group. Okay. Then in 1984, uh, a guy named Michael Aquino and his wife Lilith mm -hmm. formed a group called the Order of the Vampire, which was a break off of the Church of Satan. Uh, 1988 was the order, uh, the Hekmel Tiamat, which was the first religion dedicated to vampirism. Mm. And then in the 1990s, the uh, vampire culture really got its solidification with more of like a public image instead of like zines and newsletters, like the Transylvania Society of Dracula mm -hmm. by Elizabeth Miller, which and there was a lot of scholars and, and groups that were like fan groups, kind of like Doctor Who fan clubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the. Uh, the, the real vampire, identif people identifying as vampires became popular with a role-playing game called Vampire the Masquerade in live-action role-play. And that was where you could play a vampire persona inside of like a kind of a murder mystery theatrical experience. I see. Uh, inter uh, interactive entertainment. Okay. Immersive entertainment is what we call it today. Yeah, and this and was approximately... 1990 to 1995 was okay. the height of this uh, LARPing, live-action role-play. Right, right. And I got into the vampire culture through that, and I've always wanted something more. And I was looking for something. Like, something inside of me was saying, look and search this out. I had a calling or whatnot, and I just kind of evolved from there. Fascinating stuff. I had no idea. Um, so I'm wondering, there is some kind of, there, there are sort of rules and distinctions involved in all of this, and that there's these, uh, the sanguine vampires mm -hmm. and the psychic vampires. Um, and I'm wondering what the sort of distinction there is. I'd like to elaborate on that. Please do. There's, there's lifestyle, which are people that like kind of identify with the mythology, you know, in various formats. It's, it's kind of a philosophy for some, it's an aesthetic for others, it's a lifestyle for everyone. Uh, that has nothing to do with blood drinking or psychic vampires. I see. So that's entirely separate. That's entirely separate. Um, however, psychic vampires and sanguine vampires, which is sanguine is the blood drinker mm -hmm. and psychic is the energy vampire, to me it's the same thing. Just awakened or not awakening, blood drinking is one form of consuming mm -hmm. energy. Now, people will disagree with me, and there's a variety of different opinions, but from my experience of 25 years active in the vampire culture, that's the reality that I've experienced. I see. Okay, and then there's, of course, blood fetishists. Most of the people you see go on TV are just trying to get attention. They're lifestylers who are like, oh, we're going to drink mm -hmm. this blood so we get five minutes of fame. But they're not, as you said, awakened. Now, can you go into that phrase a little bit, awakened, and what that really means? Well, awakening is basically kind of the understanding that you're energy sensitive. It's kind of like, um, now, not all vampires are energy sensitive, which means the third eye, kind of like the sixth sense mm -hmm. kind of story, okay? When you're energy sensitive, what a vampire is, is a human being, a normal human being, that has a higher need for, cons uh, basically, their body does and their... Uh, does not generate enough life force okay, to balance everything out. So they have a need to take life force from other sources. The best source, which is already refined energy, is other humans. So there's unawakened vampires will basically take life force and, and emotional energy from you. Okay, and these are what we call emotional vampires. They'll drain you. And that's not necessarily esoteric, but a psychic vampire needs life force. An emotional vampire needs emotion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. And what happens is, is this need needs to be sated to balance your mental, physical, and spiritual health. So it is a dependency in that way. It's, I, I, I prefer because what, well, you can overcome it. Mm -hmm. okay? And then you, then you can go beyond the, the need, and then you can use it for very powerful things like magic or, or enhancing your psychic abilities 
or you know shaping reality. I mean, there's a whole bunch of matrix stuff you can play wow. with it. Wow. Okay. Well, that's very uh, that's very unique and very different from the uh, the stereotypical image that we get here. Um, so I'm wondering for you personally, where do you fall on this spectrum? Where do, how do you identify? Well, first of all, I'm energy sensitive. Okay. I'm not super powerful. I mean, I can feel energy. I can sense energy uh, from my experience. Now, most people don't believe in that, and that's okay. I, I don't care if someone believes me or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not all energy sensitives are vampires. Okay, or practice vampires. The need is the need for life force. Okay, so what, what I've done is, over my experience, I've tried blood drinking, and actually that was more of a fetish than anything, and that was a very short-lived rush of energy, and I did it in a consensual way. Very much a BDSM, medical, uh, very cautious, like safe, sane, and consensual. I, um, I, I got all my donors tested, but I stopped doing that because I learned about energy feeding and how to do it properly and safely. The energy that's radiated from a large group of people, okay, is called ambient energy, mm -hmm. and I know how to take that. Like if you go to a concert or you go to a uh, sporting event, and it's just excess energy, it's called ambient, but that's the thinnest. The next level is kind of surface energy, which is above the, basically above the skin. Humans, kind of like a snake shedding a skin, um, radiate this energy. Okay, so getting close to people, giving massages or handshakes or sex or um, you know public speaking, allows energy to come to you. Mm. Okay, and that will basically not only sate the need but give you extra excess energy that you can use for other things. I see, I see. Very compelling stuff. And uh, but for the people on the other side of the spectrum, mm -hmm. the sanguinarians who are mostly interested in blood, uh, do you think that's motivated by a physical? Is there a physical, physiological reason behind it, or is it purely psychological? I think it's psychological because there is no scientific or psychological evidence whatsoever. So it, there's something causing it, and there, people don't need to drink blood to survive. It, right. It's just a reality. The people that do very rarely have a very limited disease called porphyria, okay, which is basically the uh, uh, a disease which 20 people have in the United States. So all these people out there saying they drink blood and they need it to survive, most of them are full of shit. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I, I will say that. They do it for publicity or sensationalism or a fetish. Right. Okay. The ones that do it as a fetish, it's a fetish. You know, if you like kitties or being a pony, uh, I don't care. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's all right for me. But I'm, I'm a realist. Yes. Okay. And my spiritual perspective is not religious. It's spiritual. Okay. So drinking blood is historically a way of obtaining life force. But there are major disadvantages. And the major disadvantage of it is you can get a disease. Right, right. Okay, or you could harm someone. If you, could, you have to be a pulbotomist legally to withdraw blood from about 28 different states. Really, okay. Yeah, you can't just go put a needle Stands in someone reason, and pull yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, there was like a big controversy about the piercing and tattoo business when it became very popular in the 1990s about whether it's legal or not. Right, well, of course, there are the health risks, as you said, and I'm wondering, you know, with that in mind, like you, you did mention briefly that there are certain precautions that some sure. people can take. Go um, down and get a blood test. Yeah. And make sure, because, you know, gonorrhea is really fun. Yeah. Okay, right. or, you know, hepatitis, hepatitis C. That's a great one. Right. I don't really particularly want that. Sure. Okay. But for the amount of energy you get, because basically there's one level above what I've already described, of the levels of feeding. So there's three levels of feeding, okay, or of taking, or gathering energy. Ambient, surface, and deep. When deep puts a connection between you and your donor, the person you get your life force from, okay, that's really hard to break. Drinking blood is not only a health risk in the physical sense, okay, and very dangerous, and particularly illegal in most places, and can be taboo cannibalism, mm. okay? Right. It creates a link that's emotionally bonding you to that person that's very difficult to break. So you probably only want to do it with people that you're very close to. And it, one person, for me, does not give me enough life force, okay, to be able to sate my need. I see. I need probably about an average of, that's why vampires are so drawn to cities, because of halos of energy, okay? To ethically take the amount of life force I need, I probably need about a thousand donors a day. Wow. And when, when you were, if you are draining this life force from people, do they feel it? Will they feel tired. depleted? If I take the radiated energy, if I go deep into someone, it's very intimate and I gotta get permission. I see. Okay, I see. but energy that people are just like, you know, you radiate heat, 
Right, right, right. Okay, the, taking that energy, surface or ambient, is completely ethical. There's I no, see. it's, yeah. there, you got the energy from somewhere else. Right, right, right. Okay, I'm just channeling that yeah. energy consciously. It's not like they're gonna pass out or something. Or no, something no, right. but if I did a deep feed too long on someone, like drink their blood or, or took too much energy from them over a longer period of time, they would become what we call a sympathetic vampire, which mm. means it's a temporary need until they balance out. I see, I see. So all these people that are drinking blood off one donor, I'm like, guys, you're gonna make that person a psychic vampire temporarily, a sympathetic vampire. That's where the legend of, maybe the legend came from, of you getting bit by a vampire and turned into a vampire. I see. But that's only a temporary condition. Okay, fascinating. Good to know, also. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, you talked a little bit earlier about this kind of people who are more into the image um, mm -hmm. than they are, they're not awakened, they're not into sort of the deeper level of it, many of them. Some, some lifestylers are. Okay. Okay, you can be an awakened vampire and a lifestyle like me. Right. I'm a lifestyler. Right, right, right. Okay, I love the fashion, the image, the fangs, the but clubs. But you walk the walk, as it were, more than some. I do it all. Right, exactly. Okay, I, I like it all. So I mean, what... I've, but like, what do you make of people who really just dip their toes in and are just in it for the the clothes, the fashion? I think it's fine. Okay. You know, I mean, you you want to dress up for Halloween as a vampire, but do it right. right. I respect you. Right. Okay. So you don't have an issue with that. That's no, right. I mean, if you do it, like, if you know, when I remember back in the '90s when I was first in the vampire community, I was as a fangsmith, I would meet some people that were like, I'm 400 years old, <laughs> and I'd be like. Okay, dude. <laughs> right, right. All right. You know, it, it's it's. We call the people that take it too seriously, like I'm Lord Ruderman of the Transylvanian Society mm -hmm. of Blood Drinking Cravats. <laughs> okay, and I'm like, all right. And he's like, he takes it way too seriously, and a little bit beyond the sense of reality. The okay. role play is fun when you're role playing. Okay, you know, just a little fun role play is sure. here. But when you take it really seriously, and you think you're 400 years old. That's the old school gaja. We call them gaja. Which, it's a, what's the is, what's the sort of etymology of that? It, it's just a word we made up to okay. describe people who take it too seriously. Okay, got it. Okay, you know, have fun. I mean, it, if you don't take the piss out of yourself, yeah. Okay, you can't look in the mirror and laugh. All right, you're not going to really get far in life. Right. And be mentally healthy. You're going to stress out too much. Yeah, I would imagine. So, do you think those gaja, those people, are just? Just doing it for an image, or are they like crazy and don't can't separate from? What I they think do? they can't separate fantasy from reality, or um, they get lost in their character. Right, it does happen. I mean, one of the things I pride myself on is being a realist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you have a very practical and sensible approach to all of this. Definitely, no, definitely. So I'm wondering, you know, it's something that you've mentioned a little bit, but the idea of a sort of a hierarchy mm -hmm. in vampire culture. Is there, you know, obviously there must be a higher echelon, a lower echelon, uh, and I'm wondering if there's sort of any kind of ritual that's needed to, to as it were, go, step up the ranks or graduate. Uh, okay, well, first of all, like any society, there's different groups. Right. Okay, and each group has its own titles and hierarchy. Okay, if you look at um, uh, sporting events or groups, there's always a hierarchy. Okay, the older ones usually rule, and the, you know, the younger ones oppose the rule, and it's like, yeah. blah, blah, you know, back and forth. Um, my clan, the Sabretooth clan, is we've, we've found a way around hierarchy, okay? We have seniority, okay, but it's just how long you've been in the family and what you know. Elders are teachers, mm -hmm. okay? However, there's what we call a VGOT, Vampire Game of Thrones, <laughs> okay, people who take it too serious and they're like setting up all these, you know, different kingdoms and stuff like that. That's just lifestylers going, having fun. Got it. But got it. a lot of times they take it too far and they're like, they'll take offense. If you don't address them as lord and lady and they'll be like, ah! Yeah. And I'm like, I, I, my clan and myself are completely neutral. We, we don't play that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we have our own organization, we have our own community, we don't have geographic control over any territory except Los Angeles, if you fuck with LA, you're <laughs> fucked. Um, I'm just kidding. Um, but we are neutral and sovereign and no one tells us what to do and if you mess with us, it's not a good idea. Okay, got it. So there, there but that, with that in mind, there are feuds then, or there have been feuds. <laughs> You know, when you put a hand on a, your little brother or sister and throwing punches, okay, yeah, and yeah. you put your hand on their forehead and they're you know, uh -huh, yeah, kind of like swinging like this. Have you ever seen the Bad News Bears in the seventies? Yes, yes, that's what I'm talking. Great about. movie, yeah. Yeah, you, 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 we're just so established, we laugh. Okay, got it. You know, if you want to take yourself like that, go ahead. 
It's not going to work out well for them. Well, no, they can do whatever <laughs> they want. I mean, we're not getting. We we we're not like we laugh at it. We think it's funny because we're a little bit more mature group. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you want to take role play, you want to role play, have fun. You know, it's like don't take it too damn freaking seriously. Right. All right. It's generally a good uh, good mode of thinking for anything in life. We have a good sense of humor in Sabretooth Clan. Very important. Very important in general. Um, so then there's this other component. Uh, speaking of sort of humor or things that people some, sort of... I feel like there's a preconception maybe mm -hmm. that a lot of people into vampirism are doing it for, for sexual reasons or fetishistic region, reasons primarily. Do you find that to be true? Yeah. What, so it is true. Well, I mean, not all people that are in the vampire culture... I mean, the vampirism, in its truest sense, is about that need for extra energy. Right. Okay? Right. However, the mythology has been a tool that people can use to identify with that mythology. Real vampires are real. I mean, they're just, like, normal people. I mean, I know Uber drivers that are vampires mm -hmm. and bartenders and, and politicians. I'm, I know I have three vampire friends in the European Parliament. Wow. Okay. They're just... They're, Normal people that have a higher need for energy, do they choose to get into the subculture and the lifestyle? That's where the culture comes in. And that the vampire mythology has created something. So the vampire mythology is a dominant, the predator and prey, kind of archetype. Right. It's part of the archetype. So if you want to enjoy the role play and you want to get sexy and, you know, your girlfriend be the... the you know, virgin mm -hmm. that's going to be seduced. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're the vampire hunter. Yeah. Okay. Or the vampire hunting. It's a good role play. Sure. But it's also a very symbolic of the d dynamic. But it's so it's naturally dominance and submission, but it's not always looked at like that, like Fifty Shades of Grey kind of. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, Twilight fan fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the sometimes that's the image that comes to mind. But what you're talking about is much more measured and sophisticated. I yeah, uh, most of the people in the vampire culture that surround the culture around the Sabretooth clan, we are in 28 countries, okay? And we do a lot of things like go to museums and, and um, Sabretooths are usually the educated members of the vampire community. Got it. Very cultured. We love world. culture, Just we're yeah. junkies for culture. Right. Um, but the vampire community is so diverse it's just as diverse as the normal community, or the yeah. gay community, or whatever. I mean, there's so many factions and groups and organizations and everything. We just kind of do your thing. Makes sense, you know? Um, so, speaking of culture, mm -hmm. we, you know, us here, of course, what do we talk about day in, day out? Movies, TV, pop culture. I know yeah. you're a pop culture junkie. Oh, a little bit. Very aware just of that stuff. Bit. So I'm wondering, I'm a horror film, horror anything fanatic. And I'm wondering to you, what is the defining fictional portrait or portrayal of a vampire? Well, if you want to talk about fiction, which we all enjoy. Yes. Okay, maybe some people don't enjoy it. Um, I did on uh, the YouTube, for the YouTube channel VampireWorld.com. Okay, I did a top ten vampire movies. And I won't spoil all of them. <laughs> but I think um, my favorite movie is What We Do in the Shadows. Okay, yeah, the comedy, right? Yes, the, uh, that's my favorite vampire movie. Interesting. Okay, but I, uh, I also like Lost Boys. Like, some of the iconic films are Lost Boys, um, Lover, uh, Lovers Left Alive. Right. Um, uh, uh, what else? My partner keeps pushing Fright Night on me, but I'm A not, Fright in, I'm Night, not yeah. into Fright Night. Okay, uh, all right. But that's his thing. Uh, <laughs> Lost Boys is definitely one of the most iconic things, where the vampire is the antihero. The Got vampire's it. the main character. Got it. Are you are you familiar with the strain? Do you like the strain? I love the strain. Really? Okay, yes. cool. Yeah. I love that. I've seen the first two seasons religiously. I'm in the middle of the third season. Um, and I really like it because it's a nice spin on the vampire mythology. It 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 plays where like here is its own mythology and then it plays with what spins off on the public. Right. The old, the, what I call the vampire mythos, which is your standard modern Western vision of a vampire. Right. You know, you know, affected by sunlight, fire, Bela Lugosi, Christopher Lee, etc. Um, that's the old school version, but the modern school version is the new school version. Is basically the standard things that affect vampires, like sunlight, holy symbols, um, uh, garlic. And they live forever, and there's a master vampire. Right, right. That right. modern mythology is very versatile, but there's a certain common elements. Like the Anne Rice vampires, what they have in common with Dracula, what they have in common with Fright Night. Um, like Anne Rice vampires don't shapeshift, they don't turn mm -hmm. into bats. Okay? They're a more sophisticated mythology. Uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula is more religious. Yes. Okay? And cursed by God. While Anne Rice's vampires are basically atheists. Mm. 
uh, until Memnock the Devil. Yeah, yeah until her personal change and that. Yeah, yeah. And, and she's come back to us. Oh, she has. Oh, oh she's she's a reformed non catholic <laughs> So she's gone all over the spectrum then, come well, back around, as people do. I think Anne had a little difficult time when her husband died. Okay, well that's understandable. Yeah. That's understandable. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're so up on the pop culture of Absolutely. vampirism, because we're into that too. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to talk about that sort of thing. But I want to get back to you and okay. your life, and I'm wondering about the Endless Night the Vampire Ball, these these gatherings, these events. <clears throat> Can you tell us a little bit about that, and sure. what and and where do you hold them? What's the sort of uh, logic behind what, the cities you pick? Are you familiar with William Blake? Uh, no, I'm not actually. He, he wrote a uh, really good poem called "Ages of Innocence," and um, my passion is Jim Morris. Oh, of the Doors. Yeah. yeah, I see. I used to go to his grave every day when I lived in Paris. Wow. Okay, I was a tour guide in Paris for a bit. Wow. And um, I ran a tour company called Mysteries of Paris, and we had one tour called Path of the Lizard King. And I did a research on where he found his name for the doors. When I was 14 years old, I read this poem called Ages of Innocence. Okay, and in there, there's a line that, you know, opening the doors of perception is where Jim Morrison got the name for the doors. A few lines up is, some people are born to sweet delight, others are born to endless night. I thought that was a perfect name for a vampire party. And when I started, when I was working in the Vampire the Masquerade live action role playing games, I wanted more. The role playing games were a little bit too uh, um, structured. And my girlfriend went to me and she's like, look, I want to have sex, dress up, and go by a cool name and go to a coke bar, dance, and not have to do math to be in a nightclub. <laughs> okay, because you know, right. these role playing games, you need to have all these stats and character sheets and stuff like that. And I said, uh, what do we do? And she's like, drop all the rules and we'll have... So basically, we kind of helped build the lifestyler version of the vampire community. I see. Not the role players, which is something... Vampire the Masquerade is its own thing. And yeah. I love Vampire the Masquerade. It's a great game. Um, and it has probably been the greatest influence in the vampire culture ever. The lifestyler's kind of taken that a little bit. Okay? I see. And if you look at um, True Blood... Yes. If you've looked at uh, Blade. Blade, that's what I was going to okay, say. Okay, and you've looked at Underworld. Yes. All of those are direct copies of Vampire the Masquerade. Interesting story and, and look. You, you know, uh, the people that did Underworld got sued by White Wolf, the company oh, really? that publishes it, and they, they settled out of court. Wow. The Vampire wor vs. Werewolf thing comes from Vampire the Masquerade, not before that. So in the timeline of the Vampire Mythos, the history of the Vampire Mythos, the... Um, uh, vampires vs. Werewolf rivalry came from Vampire the Masquerade, not from any other mythology. Mm. In fact, in a lot of old mythologies, when a werewolf, werewolf would die, they'd become a vampire. Interesting. Yeah. Well, because there's the thing that some in, in older mythology, there's the vampires turning into wolves themselves. Sure, right? that's, but that's just yeah. shapeshifting. Okay, I see. So they can shapeshift in any animal then, as opposed to well, like, it depends on the thing. Like one of the mythologies in my clan is where felines, not. You know, if you look at David Bowie's movie, Cat People. Yes, great movie. Okay. That's kind of the saber tooth philosophy. We're okay. more, more feline, while other clans are more wolves and bats and stuff like that. Got we don't it. do the wolf and bat thing. Got it. We like wolves. We get along <laughs> with wolves fine. We got a couple werewolves that hang out with us. Okay. Okay. Right. Self identified werewolves. And we're friendly with the wolves. But, you know, I've, I've had people take the. The myth, when, when you know, when you're a historian, you know the, the origins of that, and they take the werewolf versus vampire thing, like, you know, there was a guy that was a, a French werewolf, a glue, uh, um, guru, uh, loop guru, uh -huh. and sorry, my French is a little bit. It's been <laughs> 24 hours since I got back. That isn't me. Um, and he wouldn't talk to me for six years because he thought there was a battle between vampires and werewolves. Wow. I'm like, dude, that's from a role playing game. <laughs> okay, so the mythology's fun. It helps you enhance things, um, but it's not, you know, you got to know the history. Of course. Things. Absolutely. That's imperative for anything. Um, but I'm wondering, you had this other element, uh, the, the Fang Smith. You're a sure. Fang Smith. And can you explain a little bit about the process behind creating Fangs? Fang Smithing is basically when I was in the Vampire the Role Playing Game, my girlfriend came to me and she's like, I want those Fangs that guy's making. We met a Fang Smith named Gregor mm -hmm. in New Jersey. <laughs> um, don't tell anybody. Okay. And. So she's like, I want to go to the prom as a vampire. And I said, all right. So we got fangs made. And then the guy retired. Oh. And I was working in a, uh, uh, a, sh a store in the local mall selling sexy shoes. Nice. Strippers and, and club kids. 
and this guy came in and he uh, he saw my fangs on. He's like, dude, you got to come to the limelight in New York. And have you ever seen the movie Party Monster? Yeah, All yeah, right. of course. I actually used to. I grew up right across the street from the limelight. Really, on right across Street and Sixth Avenue, between Fifth and Sixth. Remember the old Barnes and Nobles right there? Of course. Yeah. All right. I grew up right there, so I know it well. Well, I used to live in the building. Oh, really? Yes, I worked there from 1993 to 2006. Wow, that's on, amazing. F- through Estate and Avalon afterwards, and I knew Peter Gation. Peter Gation, and of I course. was there, and I knew Michael Alec from the movie Party, the guy that, yeah. the, the real guy, and he that's murdered. when I started making fangs. Wow, I amazing. knew Angel Mendez, and I knew all those guys. So Sabretooth, my clan, has been associated with the Limelight Building since the beginning of our family. We started this, the Sabretooth clan in that building. Wow. It's yeah. a strange coincidence there. It's very, very fascinating stuff because I know it so well. Um, so, yes. I wanted to tell you about The Endless Night. Oh, yes, please. Let's I'm go. Sorry about that. No, let's come um, full circle with that. Endless Night is basically an event that I designed for my fan clients and for the vampire culture to gather. Okay? And we started in uh, the first event was 1996 at the Bank Nightclub on 225 East Houston Street in New York. And it went over so well. Peter Gation from Limelight invited us to do a vampire ball. The biggest vampire ball was I ran was 2,800 people at the Limelight on a Tuesday night. Wow. And the uh, legend has it that the woman Susan Walsh, who was investigating these village vampires, disappeared at that party. Wow. Well, I don't know. Amazing. Well, okay. I saw her there, but um, she uh, was invest- So if you look up Susan Walsh, there was a huge controversy about vampires in New York City in 1996. And uh, then I, I got a couple opportunities to host vampire lounges around the country. We opened a vampire club at a club called Mother uh, in New York City. Okay, and that was a legendary club. It ran from 1996 to 2000. Closed on Mother's Day. It was very really interesting. So there. there's an entire history behind this. And uh, my friend Rosemary Ellen Guiley is writing a book on the history of the Endless Night called Vampire World History. It should be out in about about a year. Um, and it's a timeline of the entire vampire world. And if you go to vampireworld.com slash history, you can actually see the basic outline of the book. Amazing. Well, you figure very heavily into all this, obviously. Well, I've helped out a little bit. More than a little bit. So The Endless it. Night, I went to the Anne Rice, the Memnock Ball in 1995, right after Memnock came out, and you like walk in the door, and Anne Rice is sitting there on a, in a carriage with Kirsten Dunst, dressed in the dress she died <laughs> as... Claudia in the movie. There's the doll house. I mean, there was Victorian dancing. It was 6,000 people. I could never afford to run a vampire ball like that. And then the next year I went back and the Anne Rice fan club had like not the same budget. Got it. Got okay, it. so I'm like, you know, I'm working at Limelight. I'm going to throw vampire balls and Endless Night was born and I got the name from the William Blake poem and Endless Night now has been in Amsterdam, Vienna, um, We've thrown it Barcelona, Paris, Amsterdam, um, uh, Berlin, New York, Tampa, uh, Los Angeles. We just had our first one. We do it every wow. Valentine's Day in New York, and we moved the New York Valentine's Day to L.A. because of the weather. We kept okay. getting too fr- it's freaking cold, man, even for vampire standards. <laughs> okay, so now we have the two big events we have are New Orleans on Halloween, where we're the largest, we, TripAdvisor made it as the number one Halloween party in the world because we have the strictest dress code for anyone, any Halloween party. What is it full? What do you need to get in? Three levels of dress code. Well, level zero is you're not getting in. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Yes, Period. level zero. Level one is basic black suit, black cocktail dress with a mask. Okay, so you can fit in. Level two is like costume, like steampunk. I mean, if I was wearing a nicer shirt and I was, uh, you know, a little bit more decked out with a mask and more makeup and stuff, that would be level two. Okay. Kind of higher and couture goth. Level three is if you go to Venetian Carnival. Mm, so then we have a costume contest. That's highly advanced. It's that's like the complex level. stuff. Got it. Got okay. It. So we're having on Halloween weekend, October 28th in New Orleans is our main event at the House of Blues in New Orleans. We've, we've been there for 10 years now. Awesome. Okay. We're having gods and monsters. So you can come as a god or a monster. Very cool stuff. That's so awesome. Every every new, all the endless night events are basically surrounding going to New Orleans for Halloween. That's our premier event every year. Sounds sounds like a lot of fun. It's for a everyone involved. I'm sure. Uh, well, that's really cool. I mean, I'm just so impressed by what you just told me. It's amazing. Um, but I'm wondering, in the sort of you know, that's that's the earthly plane, the terrestrial mm-hmm. plane. If we can take it out to the supernatural. Okay. Or the extra paranormal. 
Mm -hmm. um, how much do you? How much weight do you give to that stuff? And how much does it figure into your life? Well, there's a difference between paranormal and supernatural. Okay. Okay. Paranormal. Okay. Is has a scientific effect. There's a scientific result. Well, supernatural is like God. You can't prove right. it or not prove right, it. Right, right, right. Okay. Like, for example, what was something that was uh, paranormal in, in 1819? Uh, like, what, space travel or something like that? Air. There you go. Air was not known to science. There was an effect, but there wasn't a result. I see. Okay, so what is paranormal is energy feeding. Okay, because it's kind of legal because it's not proven by science. Right, right, right. Okay, but you can do it ethically either way, and I, I like ethics. So, but there are I've heard of you know like undead spirits and you know uh, you know in a, in a way gods are vampiric. They feed off their worshippers. Right. You know, you go to church, you're going to you know Jesus is a great vampire, <laughs> Muhammad's a great vampire. Yeah, it makes sense. Right. You know, so they're asking for your your worship, give them energy. So and drink for me and live forever, kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I guess there's even the blood component. Yeah, the Catholic Church is a very good example of a vampire. Corporations can be vampires too. On certainly on all of us and politicians probably as well. Sure, vampire politicians and lawyers and all sorts of stuff. Anyone who takes. Without giving something about without giving something in return. Well, there's many of those people in the world. Whether they whether they identify as vampires or not, they are. So it's vampiric. Vim vampiric because yeah. it takes energy one way. That's a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is sort of attesting to there is this dark side kind of uh, to vampirism, and I'm wondering if in the vampire subculture there's there's a more sinister end of things that you consider wrong. There's a lot of assholes. Okay, that's pretty sinister. But I, I mean, there's been vampire serial killers yeah. that are drinking blood, and you know, like um, there was uh, uh, some cannibalistic activity and stuff like that. And you know, in France, there seems to be a lot of cannibals because the French will eat anything, snails, horses, people. <laughs> um, but uh, if you look, um, I forget the guy's name uh, from the 1990s. He was he was kind of like a mini Charlie Manson of vampires. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rod Farrell. Mm. All right, that's a good... There's a lot of true crime that's related to stuff, but that's not really people that identify as vampires. They're people that drink blood or something like that, that or they're cannibalistic, um, or serial killers that are related to the vampire archetype. Okay, but they're not part of the modern vampire community. In fact, the modern vampire community is one of the most well-behaved groups of people I've ever encountered. Okay, they're, you know... I'll put it like this. Security guards at venues for endless night events fight over the night they want to dress up and be at the party <laughs> security guards yeah. ask we've never had a fight in any of our events and we don't Amazing. have any drugs really no drugs at all no kind of substance people you know we, we just had a gathering in Austria and these two Russian girls came in and said it's, it's amazing no one was trashed except for maybe one girl on Saturday night just had a couple cocktails too much but we're, we're, we drink a lot okay the endless night crowd and the saber tooth vampires but there's no violence Everybody's well behaved. The security loves it because everybody's dressed up. Okay, I mean, you show up at the venue and like the security guards are like in love wow. with the how well behaved our crowd is. Amazing. Well, that's again shattering any preconceptions or stereotypes. Um, it's just a few bad apples, I guess, who aren't even really in the, culture. the community. No, they're not. So they just co-opt it in a in a. Well, they relate way. to the archetype. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the vampire archetype is a predatory creature. Right. No, it makes sense that it lends itself to that. And on that similar note, there is, of course, religion, mm -hmm. as you said, uh, which does, to some people, play a role in this. So is, does Christianity or Satanism or any of these um, creeds or religions, do they, do they figure into the vampire culture today? I'll put it like this. I know a Catholic priest who's a vampire. <laughs> wow, that's unbelievable. Yeah. It's amazing. And I know a rabbi who's a vampire. I know an imam who's a vampire. It's about the need for energy. It has nothing to do with religion. When you're a vampire, okay, there are paths that are religious for vampires, but it comes down to the need for energy, okay? It, it's not a deficit or a deficiency, if you want to put it like that. It's a need mm -hmm. for, more, for more life force than your body can generate, okay? So the balance that out. That has nothing to do with religion. So there's Every possible religious... I mean, I know atheist vampires. In fact, I was in uh, Nancy, France at a vampire gathering, okay, in a squat. It was really cool. There was a Catholic priest, there was a Muslim, 
there was a atheist and there was me because I don't really give a crap you mm -hmm. know and mostly in France when you ask people hey do you believe in God they're like I don't care and you go so you're an atheist no I don't care talk <laughs> about sex wine and politics <laughs> okay I don't want to talk about these things and what it is is that the vampire it's about energy here now for reality not or a lifestyle okay so you got your saying size um, lifestylers those are the three basic categories okay that are identifying in the vampire and role players are kind of like a branch of lifestylers okay but you'll find every possible religious background in the vampire community any any yeah any creed nationality race it does not matter. there are satanic vampires there's Catholic vampires there's Protestant vampires, there's Jewish vampires. I know a Hasidic Jew vampire. Wow. Okay. That's, now that's something I'd like to see. And the fangs are symbolic of that. It's like a symbol. You know, it's like you got a cross for Christianity in various formats. You got an ankh, a mirror, and fangs for a vampire. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's iconic. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, it, and it translates in a way that really kind of brings this whole thing full circle, which is that this idea has endured sure. for so long. And yeah, I mean, as you said, it's kind of amorphous. There are many different ways that you can interpret it. You can make it your own. But why do you think it has this kind of staying power, this idea of, of, of vampirism? Because vampirism is the closest, it's, it's the anti-hero. Vampirism is a mythology that's tangible, that you become the monster, okay? It's, it's something where, you know, every day I get emails, like, I mean, I've shown Br uh, Brittany a bunch of these, you know, my roommate, and she's like, what the hell? Everybody asks me, can I become a vampire? Can I become a vampire? Okay, and then I have my critics saying, oh, you make fangs, you think you turn people into vampires. No, I give them a tool of symbolism, a metaphor, okay? It helps in their awakening. It's not, it doesn't define them as a vampire. But why is it so powerful? Because we have our modern interpretation of vampires. But every culture in human history has had these parasitic or predatory entities surrounding them. Maybe they're the same thing, maybe they're not. Okay, but vampires, in truth, are people who need that energy. So they've been around a human culture. They're just, you know, just like gays have always been around, or, or, you know, religion has always been around, or mythologies of ghosts have always been around. Vampires have always been with us, in mythology and in reality. And until the last 30 years, when it's been more opened in the, in the culture, it's like, Sabretooth Clan is unique because we can go and hang out with Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. We have a relationship with the Catholic Church that's friendly. We have a relationship with the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Austria, and we throw an event with them every year. Okay, so it's not about religion, but we are real vampires. We not only live a lifestyle that identifies with this and, and have a life path, but we also, many of us, have the awakening and have the energy need. So why is it enduring? Why is it powerful? Because it hits to where you can become something that, you know, other mythologies, you know, you don't become. Wow, thought-provoking stuff. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, but uh, all that progress that's been made, I think you've played a large role in doing it. Thank you. Father Sebastian, so thank you so much thank for you, joining me. And to everyone watching at home, I want to thank you for tuning in as always. And if this topic piqued your interest, I cannot recommend enough that you check out FX's The Strain. The latest season is premiering on July 16th, so be sure to watch that. And do tune in next week for another episode of Dark Times. Thanks, everyone. The world is dying. You All right. Awesome. Great work, man. Thank you. If we waited for the perfect the moment to revolt, it would never happen. I call this a win. Well, I'd put the on the door. The stream. Seemed good to me. Premier Sunday, July 16th really? at 10 on FX.